Uh, I'm Mark Chris, and I'm the uh, physician lead of the uh, MSK uh, IBM Watson collaboration to develop the Watson computer technology uh, for uh, medical care and for medical oncology decision making in particular. This system is uh, an extraordinary way for us to deal with the avalanche of information that we have that we really need to bring to bear for each and every patient and, and also to allow that information to be presented clearly and concisely to them um, and to the patient. And, and the amazing thing about this powerful computer is that ultimately the care for individuals will be more personalized. If there was one thing I've learned in this process uh, that I'd never suspected was that a computer would allow us to personalize care and allow us to be better doctors. We welcome you to a special uh, edition of Medical Grand Rounds on the occasion of the uh, Austin Weisberger uh, annual uh, lecture. And uh, with that, let me introduce Neil Maripol, who, as you know, is our uh, chief of uh, hematology and oncology, who will uh, tell us a bit about Dr. Weisberger and uh, introduce our distinguished guests. Neil. Thanks, Rick. Got my script here. So everybody, thank you for joining us today for the uh, annual Austin S. Weisberger Lecture. Um, this was established in 1972 in the Department of Medicine and honors the memory of Dr. Weisberger, who at the time of his death in 1970 was the John Huntington Ford Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine of the School of Medicine at University Hospitals. Dr. Weisberger was a distinguished scientist, physician, and educator. He was a true translational researcher at a time when bedside to bench research didn't yet have this moniker. His contributions included an early description of the use of high dose steroids for the treatment of ITP, the use of nitrogen mustard for cancer treatment, insights into the marrow toxicity of chlorophenicol and the anti leukemic effects of garlic. In 1961, he authored a seminal paper in Nature that described the first in vitro transduction of genetic material into human cells. And he was a man of, of lots of creativity and ideas. Shortly after his death, uh, his colleague Oscar Ratnoff, who's well known to many of us, described him as a master clinician, master investigator, master teacher. Ratnoff noted that many physicians are highly skilled technically, but Austin brought more to his patients than technical skill. Above all, he said, he had compassion. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Mark Chris to present the Austin Weisberger Lecture. Dr. Chris is professor of medicine at Real Cornell Medical College and Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He graduated from Fordham University, summa cum laude, with a degree in English literature, and received his medical degree from Cornell. He completed an internal medicine residency at New York Hospital and fellowship in medical oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where he has remained in servitude, uh, and has served as the chief of the thoracic oncology service uh, between 1990 and 2013. Dr. Chris has, a, has had a distinguished career as an educator and mentor, a hematologist, oncologist, and a translational investigator with a focus on lung cancer. He's the recipient of many awards and honors, including selection as a Fellow of the American College of Physicians and American College of Chest Physicians, Fellow of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Society of Clinical Oncology Humanitarian Award. He was named as the William and Joy Wayne Chair in Thoracic Oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he was the Alvin S. Slotnick Lecture Awardee at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute as well as winning an award from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Fellowship uh, as the Solid Tumor uh, Teacher of the Year. And uh, on his uh, CV, it was mentioned that he was an Eagle Scout. So uh, if you need help tying a knot, uh, Dr. Chris can, can help you out. Um, as a medical oncologist at the Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Dr. Chris has an international reputation for his contribution to therapeutic development in lung cancer and supportive care. Serving as a program project PI, a stand up to cancer dream team member, and an all one level uh, principal investigator. And I actually want to pull something up that I came across 
uh, while doing my homework. So this is the second uh, article that was on Dr. Chris's CV, and it was one of the first descriptions of unusual cancers and uh, and opportunistic infections among homosexual men in, in New York and California. So this is uh, at the beginning of the, the AIDS epidemic, uh, uh, before it was known to be a virus and how it was transmitted. And it's timely given that, of course, in Cleveland, we are the hotbed of infectious disease epidemic at this point in time. Uh, in any case, thank you for the chuckles. I appreciate that. Um, in any case, Dr. Chris has served on many national committees and editors boards of top journals, and many of his trainees are now household names in thoracic oncology. After stepping down as chief of the thoracic oncology service at Sloan Kettering last year, Dr. Chris assumed a new role as lead physician for the uh, Sloan Kettering IBM Watson collaboration. Dr. Chris and his colleagues are working with an IBM team to develop a powerful cancer research built on the IBM Watson system to ultimately provide medical professionals with unprecedented access to current and comprehensive cancer data and practices. And as lead physician of this collaboration, uh, Mark is spearheading the effort to train the Watson computer to learn about cancer care, how physicians think, how they integrate medical information, and their experience in personalizing cancer treatments. So the overall goal is to leverage artificial intelligence to provide us with decision support in creating individualized cancer care plans for patients. In 2011, I had the honor of working closely with Mark as we uh, co-edited the American Society of Clinical Oncology's Blueprint for Transforming Clinical and Translational Cancer Research. And I learned firsthand that his reputation as a thoughtful visionary was well deserved. We're honored to have Dr. Chris with us today to speak to us about his experience leading the Memorial Sloan Kettering IBM Watson Project. Dr. Chris. Thank you, Neil. All right. Some, some, some of that stuff that. is true. Uh, and I'll get you on the... So the, the, this is sort of a redemption for the Chris family. Um, I think maybe the last time the Chris family was on this campus, it was my father in 1941 being escorted home by his mother after failing out of the case. <laughs> it seemed odd to me that despite being accepted here, being actually the first in his family to go to university, he, he decided for some reason only he and God would know to take up employment in one of Cleveland's most prestigious foundries and he began working in the foundry and not going to class. <laughs> this, this is the foundry tree uh, that you're getting here today. Actually, my grandmother uh, came and talked some sense into him, and uh, he did graduate from college, by the way, as the rest of history, and I'm happy to say that. But I'm, I'm happy to be back here, but happy that you didn't like you know, black, black ball me or something like that for my family's prior uh, stuff here, prior activities here. Ah, Dr. Weisberger. Um, it's sort of hard to uh, uh, compare oneself to him. I think he's one of those people that just, just did it all and was obviously beloved. Um, one thing, though, we, we, did, we, we did both participate in one very, what many would say now is a high-risk behavior, and that would be swimming in Lake Erie in 1950 and 1960s. Uh, maybe you would say that that was perhaps foolhardy, but we both both did that. I, I pulled out one line about him, though, and and you know to have this, you know, on your epitaph to say that he he kind of was good in everything, which is just an amazing amazing thing to say about somebody. Um, we all have special skills, but very few people kind of have it all, and he seems like somebody that that really that really did that. And it's an honor to be able to uh, speak on this today. Um, again, I, I, my disclosures, I am not an IT person. I am an early adopter. I owned a Commodore 64. Again, the great here people know what I'm talking about. I owned an, an IBM uh, 
XT, and again, the gray hairs will know what that is. Um, but I, I'm not an IT person, and I was uh, brought into this project not, not as an IT person, but as a physician, uh, and with the idea that we were going to develop this system like we develop a physician, and to have a system that integrated with the way physicians work. Uh, and, and frankly, to the trainees in the room, that this device, Watson Oncology, would be trained like we train a physician and kind of use that as the model. So that was kind of cool for me. So how do we decide um, decisions uh, for cares of patients? Now to the younger people in the room, this thing at the top is something called a textbook. I know you may not know what that is, um, but it, it, it used to be very powerful. They're, they're kind of next to the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, people would, after they finished with them, they would go to this one. I, I was shocked, you know, our, our chief fellow, in one of the best and brightest of our institution, she really had never heard of the DeVita textbook. And I'm not sure she knew who DeVita was, actually. Uh, fame is fleeting. But how do we make decisions? We would have a textbook, we would have medical records, we would have imaging studies, we'd have information about drugs, we had information about blood tests. And we also had this person, the learned colleague, because when we really didn't know or it's something we haven't seen, we would call on somebody. We occasionally would talk to a computer, but it would be a kind of a one-way conversation. And this looks actually looks a lot like an IBM XT, uh, which are probably in uh, you know, landfills across our, our great country. And then we, we would deliver the decision to the patient. I mean, this is sort of the traditional model. And I, obviously, there are many things wrong with it. But what, what's happened? A, it's a very big world out there. Uh, and, and unfortunately, you've really learned that in the last few days. The amount of information in medicine is extraordinary and growing by the minute and it is now on one of these nice computers. Our imaging is uh, extensive, it's detailed, and frankly we're only tapping, remember we're just looking at a visual, we're doing really nothing with the digital data that's behind the images we have now. But it's all there, and it's all there for the picking. And then what we know about interrogating the person's DNA and the tumoral DNA and all the other changes that are around it, and this kind of tries to, to say all the things that we have. And we still have that learned colleague down there. People love those certain, and we have many learned colleagues now. But this is the other problem, and that is the exponential rise in medical publications. This goes, what, 55 to, to 2010, and, and you see that number, it's going up. Yes, the quality is not there, and many of this, this stuff is paid, uh, but, but we have many, many more things. And also, the kinds of information that we are asked to pick out of an article is very, very technical. I'll show you an example of that later on. So, we, many of us said, let's, let's have computers help us out here that have breadth and depth and to help us in these decisions. We can have integration with the electronic record. And also we can have a lot of coordination. Obviously, a test is needed for best care. We could order that, that test and do it electronically. And of course, we have issues with payers. Um, there's also a bit of, uh, I guess, carrot and stick. This is just some of the uh, uh, upcoming and, and, and completed parts of the Affordable Care Act. And there are many things here, and I'll pick on this one, decision support for national high priority conditions, and I put you cancer as one of them. And this is, again, something that is part of the meaningful use uh, in the health uh, information technology sector. Um, I, I, I spend most of my time now on trying to take genomic data off of patients' tumors and then translate that into better care for those people and also better research in the laboratories that I collaborate with. And this is our uh, version of this uh, platform. This is MSK Impact and Illumina HiSeq based platform. And here we uh, interrogate uh, 341 genes. Uh, I'm sorry you, you can't read this, but you don't, don't really have to. Um, these genes are a consensus panel of genes important in solid tumors from the different practice groups our institution. Uh, everybody could propose a gene be included in this panel. And the idea is that everybody has the same test on this uh, Illumina platform. But when the result when the result comes out, this is what the doctor gets. This is what lands on your desk. 
which uh, is pretty pretty intimidating. Uh, as I like to say, they didn't have DNA when I was in medical school. Actually, they did. But we surely didn't have molecular biology. Uh, and, and, and this is the, the punchline of this. I'll, I'll highlight it here. So to somebody who, who trained when I did and gets this, and I have to understand this, I have to understand how this influences my patient's therapy, and I have to explain this to the human being that the specimen came from. That is not, not an easy task. And, and, it, and uh, uh, I had this discussion the other day, and, and somebody said, you know, this looks a lot like Egyptian hieroglyphics, and actually it's not, not too far away from that. One last thing, and then just uh, as we think of uh, Dr. Weisberger today, that how, how humbled we can be. Here was a special article in the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Schwartz. I, I, uh, this man is in heaven. I got to channel him. Um, basically, it's saying that the computer is going to take over medicine and be part of our daily uh, work. And I'll show you some more text from that. Please note where this article is from. 1970. So basically, he, when you just, just read this article, it's just extraordinary. Uh, it could have been written by anybody today talking about the kinds of things I'm, I'm talking to you about. So obviously we need some, some better way to go. This old system is not working. Um, my apologies to the people that, that are our IT specialists in the room, but I just want to make sure that we all understand some basic terminology. One of them is natural language processing, uh, and that is simply that the computer can understand natural language, written, the written word. And, and it's not as easy as you think. And, and here's an example uh, from our buddy, uh, our friend Siri. So you go and you ask Siri, I need a table for two for sushi on Friday. So what does the, comp the computer think you're asking for, by the way? A table. A table. I need a table. <laughs> and then I'll also what I need, I need, I need two tables, and I need sushi on Friday. Now, think of what, what you know what this really means. It means you want to go out to dinner on Friday and you want to have sushi and you're looking for a reservation for two people. And that's not, that's not simple. I mean, you have to teach the computer that. I mean, computers are beautifully accurate but, but extremely literal. So what I didn't understand when I got into this is so this pops up and, and Siri did a good job. She gives you a Japanese restaurant with a table at, at 6 p.m. When you say, when you click yes on this, information goes back to the home office in Cupertino that says that you said that this was the right answer. So the information of how and God knows what secret sauce they have over there in Cupertino, um, but the information that led to her being able to say that then gets updated, as it were, or enhanced based on your accepting this. And then that is, that's machine learning. Not, nobody was, nothing was programmed, but, but that correct answer did that. So what's IBM Watson? Um, it's a gigantic computer. Uh, it is, it has very advanced natural language process capability, and it has this capability for machine learning, cognitive computing. So I'd like to do now is go to uh, each minute need to end uh, previous. I need to go to an eight minute alt tab. Oop. No, I was too fast. Alt tab. Alt tab. Now as I hold down alt up, oh, there we go. I'm about to show you, if I can, I need to get the full screen here, an eight minute video. And this is the uh, PBS NewsHour video the day that the IBM Watson computer played in jeopardy. Man versus machine. Science is just not putting that nation to the test. Now, all competition is underway. It's right with the latest and greatest superpowers to catch your fate. The very thought occurs this week on the popular game of Jeopardy! And who's our science correspondent, Miles O'Brien, that's right in. 
now, I'm not a guy who makes a lot of excuses. But I didn't get much sleep the night before I found myself here, getting ready to play Watson, arguably the smartest computer in the world, in a game of Jeopardy. That's David Ferrucci, Watson's pal Papa. So we were there about 10 rounds of the house of the fifteen. So there's 10 rounds, there's 90 of the walls of the house of the So he uh, introduced me to the Silicon Project. So all the world is about 2,000 people in the world of that system. Uh, but this is a bunch of land. But for those of us who don't have a doctorate in computer science, Watson is equivalent to about 6,000 high-end home computers. But the secret sauce is the software that gives Watson the ability to understand language like no computer ever has. Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. That's it. What is Jericho? Correct. Well enough to play Jeopardy at the highest level. The top money winner Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings, who won 74 games in a row in 2004. Jennings' amazing run caught the nation's attention, including some IBM executives who were looking for a follow-up to their man-versus-machine chess triumph. The computer they called Deep Blue beat Grandmaster Gary Kasparov in a celebrated tournament in 1997. They wondered if a machine could beat the best humans at Jeopardy. is the holy grail of a field called artificial intelligence. You know, making computers more like us, able to comprehend, learn, and solve problems. In the early days of computing, it seemed so easy. I had not only expect that within 10 or 15 years we will find emerging from the laboratories something not too far from the robot or science fiction page. Artificial intelligence is already here. It is used to make more accurate weather forecasts. It decides what movies and books you might like. But a computer that can match human intellect remains an elusive goal. There's still no machine that can solve everybody common sensical problems. Martin Vinsky of MIT says that with a healthy dose of chagrin. He's one of the fathers of artificial intelligence. And he told me his colleagues got on the wrong track a few decades ago, trying to create a single mathematical model of the human brain. I mean, I think that most people are cool for the magic bullet. That's the trick that will make machines more intelligent. It seems to me that you know from brain science, if you look at the brain, it's like 40 different computers. In fact, if you look at the two of those brain science, if you'll find maybe three or four hundred descriptions of different parts of the brain that can do different things. That's the way David Ferrucci sees it. He and his team of two dozen wrote many formulas or algorithms to teach Watson language skills. Language is not going to be one syllable. It's not going to be one algorithm that just understands language. It's going to be lots of different algorithms that are going to look at and interpret the language from different perspectives. And somehow we're going to be able to combine them. It took four intense years for them to write all the algorithms that make the machine Ken Jennings ready. The behind-the-scenes drama played out in the PBS Nova special, The Smartest Machine on Earth. Administrative Professionals Day and National CPA's Goof Off Day. Watson? What one is piloting? No, that's not even close, really. For a computer, Jeopardy is much, much harder than chess. He would be cast off by playing out every possible outcome and every possible move every time. It's just doing a logic puzzle uh, very quickly. And the computer is a good bad. Future's great person is author of the age of intelligent machines and several other things of the rise of artificial intelligence. He's impressed with Watson's ability to understand something as nuanced and complex as human language. If that's a query involving metaphors and puns and similes and ropes and other cultural references, it has a wide knowledge base, it can parse these complex statements and have different uh, attributes are organized in a hierarchical fashion. Watson cannot be connected to the internet when it plays Jeopardy. It wouldn't be fair. So the team filled its memory banks with the entire world of encyclopedia, Wikipedia, the internet movie database, much of the New York Times archive, and the Bible. 
that's synthesizing all the data is the key. To do that, the key turns to a technique called machine learning, which teaches computers by example. Rather than trying to define the letter A, programmers instead give the machine millions of examples, and it figures out a unifying pattern that it it's never seen before. Watson also ingested thousands of correctly answered Jeopardy questions so he could learn the patterns of success in the game. He found himself arguing by Watson P. Um, I, I make an effort to call it good, uh, but we are occasionally to look into the view. Two days, and you find it with a reward of five and trace the symbol of the third. What about it? What are you doing? He's a formidable foe of his own learnings. Did I mention I didn't have a very good breakfast that morning? Let's finish the Northern Zone's capital city. Let's do it. Manila, Kathmandu, and Jakarta. Watson. What is Kathmandu? Kathmandu. Who's faster now? Who do you think I got to go? Let's do a presidential rhyme time for 200. Here we go. For lots and the impact animals. Watson. What is Obama's llamas? Obama's llamas. Yes, that is what this category is all about. It amazes me how Watson gets all the jokes, the wordplay, and the puns that are hallmarks in Jeopardy. And Watson gets smarter. The world is based on the right answers. How do you adjust this interpretation? And we're now from not being confident, so it says they're more confident in the right answers. So the Watson surprises you? Oh, I don't know. Why did you get that one? I don't know. Why did you get that one? I don't know. Computers will learn, understand, and should surprise us. Hmm. What could be wrong with that? Oh, well, excuse me. Can we leave it up? I'm Japan. I'm Oh, yeah. There is that. A machine that becomes a psychopathic murderer. I only want to be yours. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Certainly artificial intelligence can be destructive. It's already used in our weapons, or smart weapons, that have been our intelligence. It's at a huge risk across the world, and it intelligently navigates and makes its own decisions. Uh, technology can be destructive, particularly in the wrong hands. Uh, the positive side is that these tools can help overcome human suffering, help uh, cure disease, uh, alleviate poverty, solve the energy problem, clean up the environment, and there's a lot of good things you can do with more intelligent technology. If you get a machine that fully understands language, and you learn, you just sit back and watch, right? But we're not, we're not, we're not quite there yet. We're not 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 there yet. we are not there yet 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 we are I think that brings out a lot of the concepts um, that are part and parcel of this. I need to get back now to to tab. I need to go back to him. Yeah, I think that'll give me back to my slides. So there you go. That's it's oncology there. <laughs> So those of you that are well, joining me for lunch, I can tell you some secrets if you want to go on to uh, Jeopardy. Uh, how to win Jeopardy. Who is that? Kesha. Kesh <laughs> Thank you. So I think you've gotten the... Uh, difficulty in, in understanding language and the nuances, which that's our job, actually. Our job is just understanding those nuances. And so while it's suited to this, it's not a task that we really, really conquered it. The, the other th couple of the things about how to win Jeopardy. Um, I, when I first saw this, I thought it was all about information. 
that if you just had immediate access to all the information, you could win Jeopardy. But you can't. And, and, the, and to win Jeopardy, you have to know the right answer, and you have to buzz in. You have to know it quick enough to buzz in. And the grand champions are like up here, where these little red dots are. This, green, this brown line here, this is where Watson was just having all the information you could possibly get. It wasn't anywhere near where it needed to be. And what got it up to that range to beat and compete with the humans is this machine learning. So it's a very, it's, it's really a, a next step in computing, uh, and, and you can't achieve these sort of things without it. The other thing I want to point out, and, that, and which is to the physicians, um, I, I thought Watson gave you the answer. If you heard Faruqi, it doesn't give you an answer. It gives you a list of answers, and it's confidence that each answer is the right one. And it makes a list, one thing at the top that you think is the most reasonable and other possibilities and tries to exhaustively list all the possibilities and let you move it up and down. It's exactly really how, how we think. And, and you'll see in, in the, the demo I'm going to show you in a second um, how, how, that, how that works. Okay. Um, I, I, I just wanted to show you uh, another example before I, I show you the, uh, uh, the capabilities of, of, of these kinds of ideas. Is this is a project done by uh, some members of um, our uh, strategy and development a strategy and innovation team at MSK. There are a bunch of uh, folks that spend their days analyzing the data of Sloan Kettering, uh, both to run it better, uh, aid in research, and, and just to, to develop new strategies. And for some crazy reason, to the lung cancer people here, they were fascinated by this paper that was a change in uh, care in lung cancers. And basically what this paper showed is that if you have an adenocarcinoma of the lung, it made more sense to have a, a chemotherapy regimen of pemetrexid and cisplatin was better than a chemotherapy regimen of gemcitabine and cisplatin. It was not a conclusion of the paper, actually. It was a sub-analysis, and it generated this curve. What, what our scientists have done is what I'll call a virtual clinical trial. And, and, and uh, Alex Gregorenko uh, led this team. So what he did is he created a, an algorithm as a real or, or a pathway or a process where he went to our electronic medical record and said, compare the survival of persons with stage four lung cancer that had this chemo regimen versus the other chemo regimen. And he did it without extracting the data. He just taught his uh, system where to get the data out. There was no spreadsheet here. And lo and behold, and this is data that, that he's in the process of publishing now, but gave me permission to show today. Here, here's the actual uh, paper that I showed you a second ago. And here's what he pulled up. So by just creating this system, to go into your medical record, he in essence did, well, I call it a virtual clinical trial. He didn't select patients, he didn't, you know, like we traditionally do, you know, the old Excel spreadsheet, you decide what fields you're going to do. He just asked the question. And he did this, by the way, with kind of homemade stuff. It's the old kind of, you know, Radio Shack kind of uh, way of doing things. This was not a, a system. And this is stuff that our people have been wor working on and, and we hope to take further here. So why did MSK get involved in this thing? Well, it really was kind of the right thing at the right time for us. Um, we were looking for ways to improve care um, and, and then to ensure the best care was delivered. We, we wanted to get innovations out quickly and we wanted to take whatever our research output was and the research output of all, everybody in the world to, to the actual care of the patient. Uh, and we had this worldwide vision. You know, there's no reason that a, a, a cloud-based system like this couldn't be used by everybody. Um, we were very interested, though, in not creating, you know, a, uh, you know, a nice-looking automated version of the NCC and guidelines. We wanted this to have the knowledge of uh, our physicians taught, developed by the... Um, the actual cases and decision-making process of the sloan Kettering doctors and, and also by the, the so-called so learned doctors in MSK uh, that, that take part in, in teaching, teaching Watson. 
and again, the idea was to do this both for practitioners and for patients. And the last thing was, it was going to be an engine for research. I showed you one example of that um, virtual clinical trial. But think of those of you who have action. Just think about it. No case report book. You give it the list of patients on this drug, and everything just comes out of the EMR. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. We're not quite there yet, though, as uh, Ferrucci said. So, so this is what we're trying to do. What I'm going to try to do now, and now how do I turn this puppy on? Podium laptop, is that it? Don't look at my secret code. Okay. What I'm about to show you is a, uh, a, a demo. It's a, this, is, this is where we're going. Uh, Mark Majerian will be speaking at 1.30 in this room. We'll show you the, the current uh, place we are in this process. But I'm going to try to be a little bit more expansive here and show you what I think our needs are, what can be done, and I think what ultimately will be done, though, though clearly we're, we're on this journey, but we're not, we're not at the destination yet. First thing is, the idea for this whole system is it's going to be on your iPad or, or your laptop. The whole point of it is that it's going to be at the point where you're making decisions and also that you're making decisions with your patients. That, that's one, one, one part of it. And it needs to be you know, in a way that facilitates communication to you and to your patient, not you know, on a big thing like this that you're both looking up at or stuff like that. That's not the point here. You want to make the communication between doctor and patient more complete, more accurate, uh, and better. Uh, and, and use what they think uh, and know that what they think they need to make that communication. So this is a uh, hypothetical patient. So what we show here is Joe's EMR. This is a generic thing. It's called the Acme EMR, I think they call it. So you know, it's got some stuff on it. It tries to gather stuff there. Also, the the starting point here is that these are patients that have the diagnosis of lung cancer. This is not a patient where the diagnosis is in question. They have the diagnosis of lung cancer. And what we're first trying to develop here, and, and actually the reason I'm part of this process, is making that first therapeutic decision, which in many ways is the biggest decision. Probably happens well, between 100 and 150,000 times in the US every year. So this is not an uncommon scenario. So this is what a doc has now. But there's no reason that a, a, a smart system could not be culling the information that's available on that patient. And I'm in the point now, I'm, I'm prepping to see my patient for the first time. And here's the you know, cute little Watson-y thing where, where Watson is kind of kind of thinking. Whenever Watson thinks this cute little thing happens. Mark, you show that live in a little while, right? Where Watson thinks and thinks great thoughts. Turns gold, but that's right, not really. So what docs have asked and what we need is, I don't need to know that this patient uh, had an orthopedic injury you know, six years ago. I don't need to know that today. I need someone, something to go through that her record and pull out those facts that are most critical to her care today. She has stage four lung cancer, referred to me by uh, my colleague, a pulmonologist. But what we also have here is a prioritizing of the data, pulling out the most important data and prioritizing it. So the single most important piece of data on a person with stage four lung cancer is that they have cancer, they have the pathology report, that it was in a metastatic site, we know it's stage four, and it pulls that out. So that, that, that's the first part of this. The other thing it has and built throughout is an explanation of why it's important. Obviously, I think you, maybe you don't need that for the pathology report for somebody with cancer, but for other things, you do. And I'll show you some examples of that. Because um, the uh, system has the, the algorithms, it, and is always determined confidences, it knows what information can help us make a decision with better confidence. So those patient characteristics that it understands in its decision-making process and its learning previously that are most critical, obviously it knows that. And if critical pieces of information are missing that could allow the system to, to give better confidence, it could tell the doctor that. And that's exactly what this is. 
What it does is it points out diagnostic tests that would help increase its confidence in making decisions. There's also some standard things that you may want. Obviously, at, at our institution, everybody who starts on treatment needs a cardiogram, and anybody who likely will receive a chemotherapy needs hepatitis B testing and a pregnancy test of someone of her age. I mean, you can build in these kind of operational things. And if you go to the evidence, it explains why it talks about the need, that why a, um, a test uh, would be helpful for doing that. Again, I haven't seen the patient. I'm prepping. Uh, the system is prepping too. And this is its first output. And this is kind of the, first off, it's the way it's thinking. It, those numbers are its confidence that that treatment is the right one. So you see the numbers are low, and they're all together. And that's to be expected, because you know you don't have all the information on the patient. You haven't even seen the patient yet, actually. And the system says it needs more information to give higher confidence decisions. What we have in here is evidence why that that's a good decision. We also have a place for information supplied by the patient. It's called patient preferences here. Uh, and uh, we have that little button up there for clinical trials. And of course, uh, those of you that toil, Neil, you're one of those that toil in this space right now. Look, that's not, hmm. hmm. Uh oh, we lost something. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. But the problem now is because we have uh, not all the information we need on taking care of this patient, uh, it gives you a whole laundry list of clinical trials. And it's really almost not very helpful. But the, the hope is at least it has those trials out there. And the beauty of this thing, too, is it puts in front of the doctor to, to present to the patient that trials are an option. And it allows you to act on that pretty quickly. Again, you're just prepping here, and you don't know what trials. So we're ready for the first consultation. We meet with the patient. We explain what's happened so far. Uh, we examine the patient. And we, we order those tests that are, that are recommended and explain to the patient why. Uh, there, there's sweeteners in there too. You, there's, think about it. The system says you need this to make a decision. It's, it's evidence-based. It's vetted in guidelines. It's vetted in consensus panels and medical evidence. So what insurance company is going to turn that down? You've already provided all the evidence, and so the, it's very like very likely that, that things hopefully could move forward. But again, maybe that's aspirational thinking here. So you're ready for the next. You're prepping for your next visit with the patient. And again, Watson trying to help you gives you the information that wasn't available to you last time. And the first piece of information is the result of that test is that there's a mutation in exon 20 in, in, in EGFR, an insertion mutation. Uh, the brain MRI was negative, and then the other stuff you knew about already. What, what the system does then, it's said, are there more tests needed to make a high comp decision? No. And it then renders its, uh, the decisions based on what it knows that day. You see a much uh, a, a big splay. You see a, a high confidence decision and, and other ones that are of lower confidence. You see some information about the patient. Uh, you see evidence to support that decision. And what you also see is the decision for this uh, Asian, never smoking young woman uh, to give chemotherapy which is a little against the grain. People with that pr profile are supposed to be getting a lot nib, jafit nib, or uh, a fat nib. It's, and these, this explains that. So you're, you're meeting with the patient. You're ready to explain this. But of course, you, you see the patient again, and the, your first question is, how, what has happened in the interval that since I saw you? And this patient says, Oh, doctor, I've had hemoptysis. You asked me about that before, and it happened a few nights ago. Is that important? So a, a doc would have the capability, and here's an example of that, to tell the system, uh, does hemoptysis change the decision-making here? Watson is listening, finished speaking. It repeats your question, and then you ask it to, to do it again. And on the fly, and I think Mark will show you that the on the fly thing actually, that actually does work today. It gives you a whole different set of choices. Again, to the oncologists in the room, homopolysis is an absolute contraindication of bevacizumab. Bevacizumab is one of the choices. It was your top choice. That falls out and recomputes. And you see bevacizumab is not in there, a regimen not in there. You have the, you ask, should I accept it? You say, I'm going to apply it to the case. And then a new plan is, is done with bevacizumab out. As far as the clinical trials go, it now 
<laughs> goes down to one clinical trial. It knows the characteristics of that patient. It knows, and you could, you know, ideally you could specify the region of the country or, or your city or your institution as to what trials are available. But with the facts it has now, it narrows it down to one trial. And you can present this to the patient uh, as an option for their care. And again, the beauty of it, it's always on the table. You know, it's always there, something to present. Again, as you know, most patients choose not to do it, but that's fine. But at least it's presented there, and I think it will facilitate the uh, facilitate the process and uh, here is sort of the final the final screen um, these are the different chemotherapy choices that uh, you can explain why you can get more medical information if you hit the evidence button uh, in this patient, it turned out the clinical trial was not appropriate for her because of the extra visits uh, required to the hospital. Um, you have vetted this against all kinds of medical information, uh, and therefore you could hit that pre-op button and ideally get the, the pre-op there. But again, this may be a part of Dr. Chris's magical thinking uh, that that will happen. Uh, you can also output this to the referring doctor, to the pharmacist, to the nurse, to the chemotherapy nurse, to the retail pharmacy, to your quality uh, uh, operation in your institution. Uh, it can go to a lot of, lot of places. Also attached to it, the patient educational uh, information. So that's, that's where we're going. Are we there yet? No. Uh, and Mark is going to show you kind of exactly where we are later today. I somehow got mixed up here. Now, somehow we, we lost the. Uh, I, yeah, I do. I need to get that off. Thanks. And yeah, that was mixed up. <laughs> Here's an issue to the docs in the room. I, I made that decision. Uh, that Exxon 20 insertion that she should get chemotherapy. And, and here's the paper that said that. This paper had 23 patients in it. So I'm making a treatment decision based on this paper. Is that what we do? Yes. Does that exceed the comfort level of a hell of a lot of people? The answer is yes. It depends a lot on the quality of that paper. So th this is uh, one issue going forward that we're, we're grappling with and anybody developing a system like this, how strong of a piece of evidence do you need to change treatment? But we know now with the, I'll call it the N of one movement, uh, which uh, actually we're, I'm probably at the, uh, perhaps the, the, well, the well of the N of one movement at our institution. Um, I, I do think that's changed our thinking. Uh, and But how to integrate this, how to make this part of care, I, I put this up as, as an issue uh, that I do not have a solution for. Um, but again, I, I think it boils down to being, being a, a, a doctor. So how does this thing work? Again, our whole vision was to train it and make it work like a doctor. It was a system that was going to assist physicians, so the more it thought like a physician, the more it was part of the natural flow of how we care for patients, the better it was going to be. We did a little estimation, and, and you may want to challenge this number. But the truth is that uh, we determined that one of our uh, medical oncology fellows probably sees only between two and 400 patients during the course of their, their fellowship training. So it really, it really isn't a lot, and being able to supplement this way is probably a good thing. It's case-driven, uh, and again, it's, it's, it, the teaching is through um, uh, the cases. This is a little example of, of NLP. Um, I, I, I caution you that this is the toughest part of the problem. I don't know if Mark will agree with that. But, but think about it. On, on the treatment end, there's, there's eight drugs. Do the math. There's only so many combinations of those eight drugs. But who gets those drugs, that is really tough. When you look at the entire medical record of somebody to try to boil them down to those treatment choices, uh, which are probably eight or ten, is really, really tough. And, and as I said before, computers are, are very literal. So just as an example here, denies congestive heart failure, denies peripheral neuropathy. Um, it's, the, the computer sees neuropathy and says, oh, this patient has neuropathy. But they have that crazy word denies. What does deny mean? Most of us don't say deny to mean no or not. 
and, and this is you know, again just just a little example and it's all it's all kind of jargon or 90 percent that it's a performance status uh, and you know it, it's it's very very hard and I think just as Ferrucci said uh, in the in the video the, the NLP is probably the biggest challenge here uh, and, the, and the one that's probably going to take the long time that said once the system is taught uh, unlike the rest of us that can forget things it really doesn't forget things and the more times it's taught the more times that behavior is reinforced uh, the better the system becomes the quicker the more accurate it is so people ask what, what do I do uh, and you might hear from Mark what I do I don't know uh, but um, we spend a huge amount of time um, finding the relevant literature and making sure it's there. We do. We spend a lot of time uh, teaching uh, the system, uh, natural language processing, and then the nuances there, um, interpreting the information. Uh, we're doing a lot of you know curation as to the right papers. Those of you that do a literature search know that you know you put in breast cancer, and you even put in her two positive breast cancer, you get 30 articles on her, her two negative breast cancer uh, because of the filters aren't great and then that, that system those issues are there when output comes we, we say yay or nay uh, with the IBM engineer I get Mark has that under his, his shirt right you have the IBM red on your back I have the MSK logo written on my back and it's in this constant circle uh, to, 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 to finish up this is going to happen it, it is not an issue of if it's an issue of when and, and this is just a partial list of everybody that's doing this and, and don't you guys have wellpoint as one of your payers here wellpoint yeah okay you, you people saw on the wall street journal that wellpoint is going to have their kind of version of this and, and medical oncologists, for better or worse, if you choose choices, if you make choices off their preferred um, list, you are going to get $350 a month for choosing those choices off their preferred list. Evity is, is part of WellPoint. It's also, they, they've allied with Aetna. And you, you know across the way they're working, uh, uh, including clinic on, on Watson, CancerLink, and ASCO. McKesson is well working with NCCN. So this is going to happen. And many insurance carriers are already using some of these systems now to get approvals for their drugs. Uh, what are we doing? I, I won't go through all of this, but there's a lot of steps along the way. Think about it. When you really break down what happens when somebody walks in your office for the first time to making a treatment decision and taking good care of them, there's a huge number of things. But the, the one thing I, I, I want to focus on, uh, and uh, uh, Mark, I don't know if you're going to have time to talk about this, is the use of dialoguing. The one beautiful thing about this cognitive computing is it can talk back to you if you can imagine such a thing. So instead of the usual thing is, you know, um, you, know you, give me, you, you talk to a computer, you ask for an answer, uh, that's an unacceptable answer, or you answered this wrong, the computer would talk to you. It would, it would begin with by saying, what do you want to know? And then when you say, you know, I, I want to know this fact, I want to know how you best treat uh, uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, well, the computer would then say, well, I need some more information to figure out what you're talking about. Are you talking about the adjuvant treatment? Are you talking about the treatment in the metastatic? Uh, and, then, and then each question would lead to that, that refining. And it would know, just like you, if you went to a colleague and asked those questions, it would lead you to the answer that you want. And there's a beautiful thing of this, and again, it's, I think that's going to be one of the best um, parts of this system, and something that actually the Watson technology can offer here. So I'm getting a little aspirational now. Data is not knowledge, and knowledge is not wisdom. Just a, a quick reminder there. Um, this is a tremendous effort. We've been at this two and a half years now. This is my core team. Uh, Mark will talk about his core team. This is just the team in MSK. We work all the time. We mainly work in breast, uh, lung, and, and colorectal cancers right now. You saw Dave Ferrucci up there. Uh, this is a quote, and I, I think it's extremely true. You don't realize how hard this really is. By the way, Ferrucci and his team worked for seven or eight years together on natural language processing before they began that Watson, pro uh, the uh, uh, Jeopardy project. And, and anyone know what Ferrucci does now? He 
he works for a hedge fund. <laughs> and, and just a, 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 humbling, a humbling moment here, I showed you this article from the New England Journal of Medicine in 1970. I bet there's a few people here that probably were even born then. Let, let me just quote you one passage, and I'm going to end on this. Indeed, it seems probable that in the not-too-distant future, the physician and the computer will engage in frequent dialogue. The computer continuously taking note of history, physical findings, labs, and the like, alerting the physician to the most probable diagnosis and suggesting the appropriate, safest course of action. One may hope that the computer will equip to store large volumes of stuff programmed to assist in the decision making. And here's the critical point. It will help free the physician to concentrate on the tasks that are uniquely human, such as the application of the bedside skills, the management of the emotional aspects of the disease, the exercise of good judgment in the non-quantifiable areas of clinical care. Schwartz said this what, almost, almost 50 years ago. So this says it so beautifully, and I think it's a very fitting end, because I'm sure that is something Dr. Weisberger would agree with as well. And one last thought on him. I thought this was the nicest thing I read about him. And I take, take this home, everybody, if you forget, remember nothing else today, remember this, enjoying life was a full-time occupation. Thank you. I think we have time for a, for a couple of questions. I'm going to open it up. So during my lifetime, you know, computers now, I'm told, can recognize faces, can identify emotions. Uh, during my lifetime, are patients going to be interacting directly with something like an IBM Watson system uh, and, and it actually responding to their emotional state as well as providing information? Yeah, I, I, I don't know about the emotional piece. Um, uh, I, I, I would hope that the, the first step would be to, to by their words at least, to, to sense what their real needs are and, and to make it easy for them to learn what they want and to be sensitive to them. I, I would think it's possible, uh, but you know, whether it's going to happen, I, I really don't know. I, I think a key component of this, though, is, is to have the patient involved here. Uh, and this is an a, a absolute two-way street. And, and by the way, we are just beginning a project now. Um, our uh, uh, psychology group is uh, doing a structured analysis of, of how patients see this how patients would find this useful for them, how they want to interact with it, and what kind of features the patients will want. So stay tuned for that. Everybody, yeah, Cliff. So my guess is that, uh, Mark, you've had a number of opportunities to uh, run almost side by side and kind of blinded. Uh, my hope is at least that you, uh, doing a hypothetical patient, or maybe even a real patient, through the moral channels, which is a um, a, uh, a cancer committee uh, and a cancer group uh, versus what outcome would be generated through purely data to watch and how do those line up or have you done that and do they line up? Yeah, well, the, m most of our work so far, and I'll, I'll speak to the lung cancer space, has been the stage four lung cancer, where the decision is key therapy. I mean, we're building out the, you know, the uh, radiation and surgery in multimodality situations. So most of it's been chemotherapy. What, what we get now with quite good reliability is the list of reasonable choices and some prioritization there. But where we, we still fall short is among the reasonable choices that any kind of guideline um, panel would say, which is the best one. I mean, th th that's the constant refinement. So we're pretty much always in the range of, of choices that would be acceptable uh, by guidelines or, or by payer guidelines. Um, getting the one that the doctor would think best or the doctor gave in this case of the patient uh, teaching case, that, that, that's what we're working on now. And I think only through by refining NLP are we going to do that because then you're pulling out those nuances. The last thing we don't have either, and I'm sorry I, I ran over that aspirational slide and do it next, is ultimately what's going to really govern the system is 
what happens to the person based on the treatment that was decided by the system. So that, that ultimately that piece will feed back in, but we're, we're not there yet. Okay, let's wrap it up here. Thank you very much once again.